Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hello, my name is Nathan Weeb. Today I'm going to be talking to you about work that I've done with Vadim Kaluchnikov uh, that shows a whole new way of doing quantum circuit synthesis. And the key points that I'd like you to be able to take away from this talk are that we provide a new non-deterministic method for synthesizing single qubit rotations that's strongly analogous to floating point arithmetic. And our algorithm is better than existing methods if the rotation angle that we are trying to synthesize is modestly small and a small number of significant digits are required. And this is, this is important because of the fact that the cost of our algorithm actually depends more strongly on the number of significant digits required rather than the size of the rotation angle. And this uh, synthesis method will obviously have applications in quantum simulation and many quantum Fourier transform based algorithms. So we all know single qubit rotations are important because any, any arbitrary single qubit unitary can be decomposed into three axial rotations. And so as a result, the cost of synthesizing an arbitrary unitary depend, uh, can be reduced to finding the cost of synthesizing individual axial rotations. And such rotations are, of course, also used in other applications. Now, you might be thinking, uh, Single qubit axial rotations are about the simplest thing you can do experimentally. So why do we need to perform a synthesis? And the answer is, in general, of course, we could directly try to implement these things experimentally, but they won't necessarily be robust against noise. And in order to do that, we need to implement them in a fault-tolerant fashion, which means that these continuous rotations that are used have to be decomposed into fault-tolerant gates. So, there's many sets of fault-tolerant gates that, that can be used. Commonly, um, gates that are, are used fault-tolerantly are uh, the Clifford gates as well as non-Clifford gates. And for many error-correcting codes, and in particular the surface code, Clifford gates are relatively simple, whereas the non-Clifford gate is quite expensive. So what you want to do with a quantum circuit synthesis algorithm is you'd like to be able to make these rotations using as few of these hard gates as possible. So there are a number of methods that have been proposed to do uh, this decomposition. The first and well most popular me uh, method is the solovey kitayev algorithm which uh, has been used for years but this year, well within the last year, new methods have been proposed that actually uh, improve polynomially upon the performance of the solovey kitayev algorithm. And in particular, Sel uh, Selinger has shown that an efficient uh, decomposition algorithm exists that gives a t-count that scales logarithmically with the desired error. And uh, furthermore, his method is actually provably optimal for ancilla-free single qubit synthesis um, in that there, will, there are some uh, unitary uh, rotations that need to be synthesized that will have a coefficient of that's precisely four for the minimum cost required. So that means that in general, if you're not using ancillas, you can't, you can't come up with an algorithm that will be able to beat this coefficient of four here. However, nonetheless, we will beat this for uh, uh, particular cases. And what's the basic idea behind the, what we use to beat this? Well, a key assumption in Selinger's method is that no ancillas or measurement are used. We leverage measurement and ancillas in order to be able to do some really neat things that you wouldn't be able to otherwise do with traditional circuit synthesis methods. In particular, what we do is we give a way of effectively multiplying the squares of rotations. So imagine this circumstance where you have access to two rotations, this rotation and this rotation. So normally, if you wanted to add the two rotation angles, you could do that quite easily. You would just do the two rotations in, in series. But if you wanted to multiply them, then that's, that's a little bit more difficult. Our method uses ancilla qubits in order to achieve this feat. And this fundamentally is the building block behind our floating point um, decomposition. 
So what's the basic idea behind these circuits? How do they work? Well, this is the building block that we're going to repeat over and over again in different ways and in different scales in order to be able to build our synthesis method. And the idea is as follows. Imagine you've got uh, a qubit that you'd like to perform a rotation on. And here is an, just an ancilla qubit that you initially you initialize to zero. Then you begin by performing this, uh, some unitary on it, a controlled negative ix gate, which is a Clifford operation, on the uh, qubit you want to rotate. And then you perform the inverse of this operation. And finally, measure the ancilla qubit. There's two outcomes. If you end up getting zero, then you end up uh, performing a rotation on the ancilla qubit that, roughly speaking, ends up uh, giving an angle of theta that's quadratically smaller than the value you input up here. Whereas if you get 1, then you apply a Clifford operation, which can be easily inverted. So the basic idea about trying to implement a rotation using these methods is as follows. You begin by trying the rotation and measuring. The measurement can either succeed or fail. If it fails, well, then you actually haven't introduced any errors that you can't correct. So you correct that using an appropriate Clifford operation and try the rotation again, repeating this as many times as is needed in order to uh, perform the desired rotation. In practice, however, this, this actually doesn't require very many repetitions in order to succeed. And two, uh, roughly two to three uh, attempts are usually sufficient for the, uh, such circuits to succeed with high probability. Now, let's talk about a more complicated case. Before, I, I showed you how to effectively square uh, an input rotation angle. Now, I'm going to show you how you can use the same idea in order to multiply the squares of the thetas that were used before. So, just like before, what you do is you uh, have a single qubit that you'd like to rotate, and these are all ancilla qubits, initialized to zero. What you do is you then perform some unitary u that you have access to on each of these, these qubits. Then you do a multiply controlled negative ix gate. And this time, unfortunately, this isn't a Clifford operation. However, um, the same protocol occurs. You invert the corresponding rotations after this and then measure. In the event that all of the measurements turn out to be zero, then what you end up doing is you end up performing a rotation that roughly speaking, is kind of like the product of the squares of all of the rotation angles that are input. And if it fails, regardless of how many ones are measured over here, it performs a Clifford operation. So we can invert it. Now, the key, the key thing, one of the key insights behind the circuit is that fundamentally what it does is it takes large rotations that you know how to do as inputs on each of these qubits and then refines them into a much smaller rotation over here. And for this reason, we call this circuit a gearbox circuit because it transforms large rotations into very fine rotations. And this is fundamentally the idea behind our floating point synthesis method. If you wanted to perform this rotation here, then what you would do is you would, you would take, you'd break this rotation down into two components, a mantissa component and an exponent component and then perform this multiplication circuit. And then approximately after, uh, after these inputs, you'll end up getting a rotation that is close to the uh, desired one. So at first glance, this doesn't appear like it has any advantage because if you had to directly synthesize UM and UE, then the cost could be four times as large as the cost of directly synthesizing this rotation. However, there actually is a substantial improvement for in many cases because we can use our gearbox circuits in order to come up with a much more efficient way of generating the small exponent unit uh, rotation. And furthermore, if a small number of digits of accuracy are needed, the circuit for UM could be quite simple. In particular, the way that we at, in practice generate the um, exponent unitary is actually by doing repeated squaring. So I mentioned before that this circuit over here, essentially what it does is it takes a rotation as input and then it outputs the square of that rotation angle as a rotation. So this circuit over here, you can see, actually is a repeated squaring algorithm. It takes, it takes theta and then at this point it'll output a rotation that's angle theta squared. 
At this point, it'll output a rotation as theta to the fourth. And at this point, it'll output a rotation as theta to the eighth. So obviously, after a small number of repetitions of this circuit, it will end up generating a truly small rotation angle. Also, one of the neat features about this circuit is that much of the cost actually can be shifted offline or to parallel lines of computation. And you can see that in that all of these boxes in here can be actually shifted offline into ancilla preparations. And furthermore, many of these operations here can actually be done simultaneously, resulting in a very small T depth. So now that we've, I've discussed the, the, uh, the T depth and the offline cost, let me discuss what this actually does to the T count, which is the total number of T gates that are needed to synthesize the exponent part of the rotation. One of the things that you'll see is that if we, if we imagine trying to synthesize UE using Selinger's method, and we compare that to this curve over here, which is what we get by using the tree-like construction I showed you in the last slide, then you'll notice that our construction is much more efficient than Selinger's method. In fact, we end up uh, requiring a number of T gates that with 95% probability will end up scaling like this. In Selinger's method, the corresponding um, constant over here is four. So we're nearly a factor of four better than uh, what Selinger's result would tell you for this, which is a substantial improvement. Also, um, one of the things to note, though, about this method is that, unfortunately, though it's very efficient, it doesn't give you very good control over the desired rotation angle. So you'll notice here, what we have is we have a situation where this, is, this rotation is about 10 to the minus uh, 25 radians. The next one is t that's permitted is 10 to the minus 50. Then the next one is 10 to the minus 100, and then 10 to the minus 200. So this is, this is hard to do for the uh, circuit. So what we do is we actually combine our ideas and use our multiplication circuit to multiply a bunch of these exponent, uh, these tree-like circuits in order to get much more control over this and in effect enact a binary expansion of the uh, exponent. Doing that, you, you see that at a modest cost, we end up substantially improving the spacing between the different exponent unitaries that can be uh, obtained. So this is all well and good, but it doesn't actually talk about what the real costs are for doing a um, actual uh, rotation. So here, we put all the costs together as an example uh, to show how expensive synthesizing a, uh, this rotation, which is used in the quantum Fourier transform. So you'll see that over here, these are the best possible circuits that can be synthesized using single qubit and still free synthesis. And the first circuit that does a better job of approximating this rotation than the identity has 57 T gates, whereas our floating point synthesis method gives a circuit with 21 T gates. Furthermore, if we want something that's comparable to that initial approximation, we require about 27 T gates. Now, what, one other point to illustrate is our method is fantastic if the number of digits of precision is relatively small. As the number of digits of precision increase, we need a more expensive mantissa uh, unitary. And as a result, it ends up costing much more using quantum floating point synthesis in order to synthesize something with small relative error. So for this reason, our approach really should be thought of as handling small rotations that you don't need to perform all that accurately, whereas traditional methods are best to be uh, best to use for rotations where you need a large amount of precision. So in conclusion, we've provided a new method for, that, for multiplying rotation angles that can be used in order to enable a floating point synthesis of a, of a rotation angle. And unlike traditional synthesis methods, the cost depends more strongly on the relative precision and much of the cost of the synthesis method can be shifted to parallel computation paths. And this as future work may lead to uh, improved methods for doing quantum simulation where there's small but barely non-negligible terms and also may provide more efficient ways of doing uh, quantum Fourier transforms and other related algorithms. Thank you very much.